Good afternoon. I'm Julie Decker, President and CEO of the FSU Alumni Association, and I'd like to welcome you to the ninth episode of our Webinar Wednesday series. I am grateful you registered to join us in today's dialogue. Across the country and even around the world, issues of injustice, police brutality, and racism are being confronted head on. Last week, many of you articulated your disappointment when this was not named in our original social media post. We have since removed that post and shared a more vocal response, which is required of leaders today. The FSU Alumni Association will leverage our platform to give voice to our FSU family, especially our Black alumni and friends, as we collectively confront the racial injustice experienced by Black Amer Americans. We will continue this conversation and we will act. Now, to get our panel started, I'd like to introduce one of our panelists, um, and all of today's panelists are alumni, as a matter of fact. Today's moderator for this afternoon, two-time FSU alumnus Ali Moore. Ali currently serves as the Vice President of the FSU Alumni Association's Black Alumni Network. He is an Atlanta-based consultant, leadership coach, and strategist with over 25 years of organizational development, training, change management, and business readiness experience. As CEO and founder of X Factor Solutions, he is passionate about helping people from all walks of life identify and grow their unique leadership talents. Ali, thank you for your leadership and for leading today's discussion. Thanks, Julie. I'm ecstatic to be here. Um, this is a much needed conversation and um, I'm happy that the FSU Alumni Association has entrusted me to uh, moderate this panel. Uh, in, a, in a second, we're going to introduce our panelists and then give each person the opportunity to talk a little bit about the work that they're doing and the organization or the piece of Florida State that they represent. Um, one of the things that I encouraged our panelists to do when we were preparing for this is to be open, honest, and direct about what they're doing and what they're feeling. Um, as you stated, uh, my background and my profession is in organizational change. And one of the things that I always talk with the, my clients and the organizations that I work with is that as we plan for change, we must always acknowledge the shortcomings and the failures of our current situation. We must also acknowledge the frustrations and the injustices. And in this case, the topic today is the injustice that's been placed on Black Americans and our FSU Black alumni is leading the, the charge and talking about these things. But we have to acknowledge those injustices and those frustrations before we can start to plan for the future. So with that, I'd like to do a quick introduction of each of the panelists and then allow them to talk a little bit about their organizations. So in alphabetical order, our first panelist is Bridget Birmingham. Bridget is an FSU alumna and currently the director of the Florida State University Civil Rights Institute and the diversity and inclusion librarian for the FSU libraries. Her work focuses on supporting civil rights and social justice activism in the local community and building research collections that document the history of civil rights and social justice movements in the United States. Our next panelist is a good friend of mine, Dr. Brandon Bowden. Brandon is a three-time graduate of Florida State University, is currently the Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs. Brandon directly supervises strategic planning and assessment, information technology, the Center for Leadership and Social Change, the Center for Global Engagement, and co-supervises the Center for Academic Retention and Enhancement, also known as CARE, along with the Dean of Undergraduate Studies. He serves as the liaison to academic affairs, provides leadership for the university's Black Male Initiative Program, and also serves as a faculty member of the College of Education's Higher Education Master's Program. His past experiences include serving as an assistant and associate director in the Oglesby Student Union, as Dean of Students, and also as a Title IX Director. Our next panelist is Michelle Brown Douglas. Michelle is an FSU alumna, serves as Director in Human Resources with Oversight and Responsibility for Equal Opportunity and Compliance, EOC, Diversity and Inclusion, Training and Organizational Development, the Ombuds Program, and Facilities HR. Michelle joined the Florida State HR team in 2014 with over 15 years of experience in personnel management. She holds the Professional and Human Resources cert cert Certification from HRCI 
and is trained with the American Association for Access, Equity, and Diversity. Her areas of specialization include employee and labor relations, diversity and inclusion, training and HR legal compliance. She is a member of CUPA and the American Association for Access, Equity, and Diversity. And our final panelist is Dazzy Lenore. Dazzy is a two-time graduate of Florida State University. She earned a bachelor's degree in English literature with a concentration in business in 2002 and a master's degree in sports administration in 2003. Dazzy then went on to attend Florida Coastal School of Law in Jacksonville, Florida in 2010 and is now licensed to practice law in both Florida and Georgia. Dazzy is the president and owner of the Lenore Agency, an all-state agency in Kissimmee, Florida, and serves on the executive committee of the Alumni Association National Board of Directors. So welcome to all of our panelists. So we have a, an esteemed group of experts um, that are going to speak today. So now I'm going to turn it over to Brandon and then Bridget and in alphabetical order the rest of our panelists to do a quick five minutes about the organization at Florida State that you represent, the work that you're doing, and how that impacts um, the social injustice that we're talking about today. Brandon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ali, for that. Um, as Ali stated, uh, I am currently the Assistant Vice President uh, for Student Affairs uh, here at Florida State University. And specifically, I lead the portfolio that is called the Inclusive Community Portfolio. And as Ali mentioned, some of the areas that I work with, I have the pleasure of working with many of our identity areas and many of our students that would fall into these areas where they feel like they are in marginalized groups. And so um, for the last six years, I've been able to leave this area and have just um, had the opportunity to, to hear the stories, to also uh, share my stories with these students. And so I think that this is a very timely conversation. Uh, one of the other areas that I work very closely with is our Black Male Initiative for Florida State University. And so we have a, a session coming up next Friday where I really think that we're gonna have an opportunity to hear directly from our students how they're being impacted by everything going on right now. And we'll talk a little bit later about some of the, the action items, but I'm just excited to have the opportunity to be able to speak directly with our students um, as an adjunct faculty in the College of Education, but also um, as, as a staff member in Student Affairs, I have such a, a vast, um, experience and, and just being able to sit face to face with students and, and hear directly from them on their experiences. And so this time has been no different. Uh, our students have been very vocal. Our students have been uh, very adamant uh, about some of the, the action items that they want to see. And so I think that this, this conversation is very timely and I'm just excited to be a part of it and I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit more later. All right, thanks Brandon. Bridget? Um, hi, I'm Bridget Birmingham from the Civil Rights Institute, and uh, our institute really got started about two years ago, uh, and it came, well, three years ago, really, and it came out of a conversation between Fred and Dobby Flowers, the president and the provost, about how we could become leaders in this area at Florida State University. So what is civil rights, what is social justice, and how do we move those things forward? here at FSU. And so the provost reached out to the library. Um, we had been doing some, some work in that area, collecting like the Emmett Till collections, et cetera. And um, we work with a variety of partners across campus. So really the Civil Rights Institute brings together areas across the campus that had been doing this work separately so that we could leverage our unique talents together to really make a transformative difference. So some of our partners include the Center for the Advancement of Human Rights, um, African American Studies, the Pepper Center and Dr. Mayo, um, the College of Social Sciences and Public Policy, the Fan Yumi Eaton Black Archives. So we've really tried to get, get a grasp of the entirety of the, and other, other partners, of course, but to really work on changing the culture and changing FSU and Tallahassee and the Southeast for the better. So some of the things that we do, we have uh, had a Amendment 4 conversation where we brought in uh, the 
the folks who had written the, the amendment for and had them talk about why we should be restoring rights for felons when Florida is one of the few states that doesn't. We had a whole series on 1619 and what that means for Florida who had slavery before 1619. Um, we hosted movie viewings and community conversations like Just Mercy, Harriet. Um, so, so we've been really trying to partner with the community to have conversations and to really uh, do things that one, uh, highlight knowledge so that people are more educated about civil rights and social justice, but also so that they have a safe place to have conversations around race and the realities of, of America. Thank you. Thanks, Bridget. Michelle? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Michelle Douglas. Um, I am a member of the Human Resources team here at FSU, and our team is led by Renisha Gibbs, Associate Vice President for Human Resources, and also a proud alumna of FSU. Um, within my particular duties within HR, I'm the Director of the Equal Opportunity and Compliance Unit, and my team does a lot of work with regard to uh, discrimination, harassment, um, we do investigations, but our primary charge is to ensure that as an institution, you know, we're providing a space um, for all to be able to function and work without discrimination and harassment. We work primarily in support of faculty and staff, but we also extend beyond th that those groups to support other entities on the campus. I do a lot of work with Brandon and his team um, because the way that we approach our work is that it's everybody's responsibility on campus, not just one office. Um, as it relates to my diversity and inclusion work, um, I'm currently the chief diversity officer for FSU. That's not a new position at FSU. We've had a chief diversity officer for a number of years, but I've assumed some of those duties um, with regard to my diversity and inclusion work. I serve as the liaison um, to the President's Council for Diversity and Inclusion, which is a council that President Thrasher has convened, comprised of faculty and staff and students to address institutional um, concerns of equity and inclusion. I also co-lead the National Coalition Building Institute team here on campus, which is part of a national consortium of uh, diversity and social justice training. And we actually have a very active team here on campus um, comprised of faculty, staff, and students as well. As you um, can probably imagine, we've been pretty busy lately, but we're really, um, it's work that we do that we're passionate about. It's a labor of love. Um, I also serve on the university's strategic plan implementation team. Um, and this team, um, particularly maybe about three, four years ago, we, we worked together with a consultant to develop a strategic plan for the institution. And what's really exciting about our strategic plan is that we have a standalone diversity and inclusion goal. And that's really rare for a lot of institutional plans in higher education. And we went even a step further by um, actually having an implementation team. So that is something that we want to see live and be sustainable um, at FSU. So that's just in a nutshell, some of the things that I do um, at FSU. I just also facilitate um, training for diversity and inclusion and just partner with a lot of uh, entities on campus to ensure that we're providing a space um, and a workplace um, for our faculty, our staff, and also a learning environment for our students that is inclusive, is equitable, and safe. All right, thanks, Michelle. Julie? Yes, thank you. Um, so when I first arrived in November of 2018, one of the things that um, I did was to evaluate some of our programming and some of our outreach, and I did that evaluation with staff, administrators, volunteers, um, and our uh, board leaders. And I often remarked, I wanted to give FSU the 21st Century Alumni Association it deserves. One of those things that I want to highlight for, for everyone today is understanding our networks. Um, our networks are volunteer-led groups that connect alumni with shared identities and interests, and we reorganized those. Um, when I first started, we had a College of Medicine network and a College of Nursing network and we had the opportunity to meet with those deans and that advancement staff and move those networks back to those school and college um, disciplines to make room for how we were engaging our uh, black alumni network and other emerging networks that we're starting this year um, there's a lot to be proud of with our uh, black alumni network um, as you well know ali but currently there are six scholarships provided by our black alumni network 
Uh, the most recent scholarship was actually just endowed in January 2020, and we've given out about 40,000 in scholarships since the Black alumni started their scholarship program in 1989. And, and it, uh, the scholarships became fully endowed in 98. So there's a lot of good scholarship work happening there amongst many other things with our networks. Um, another thing uh, since I came on at FSU was uh, working with Michelle's office on staff diversity and inclusion training, which we started in September 2019. Our staff members are tasked now with um, a little self-directed learning and pursuing the certificate provided by the uh, office that Michelle oversees, FSU's HR Diversity and Inclusion Office through their certificate series. Uh, Michelle came and led our Embracing Diversity uh, training and we really appreciated that. It was a Monday morning staff meeting with some really good conversation last fall. Michelle also referenced the National Coalition Building Institute and our team did go through a workshop in November 2019. Um, and this is um, where staff came to the Alumni Center to talk to our staff about things around um, equity, inclusion, microaggressions, how we um, engage our 360,000 alumni um, and work with each other. And when we hire, um, we are going to commit, and I'm committing that when we hire, we're going to ensure that our staff is signing up for these diversity inclusion trainings within their first six months. It's very important that a staff that's working um, with alumni across the country and around the world, that they're prepared. Um, and speaking of hiring, um, we work closely with our Black alumni group, our board, and other networks when we have our positions open. We're soon to have um, four positions open, and we will share those with our networks to share broadly so that we have a diverse, deep pool of candidates um, so that we can continue to have our staff reflect those in our alumni base and ensure that we're hiring um, with diversity in mind. Uh, moving forward, we will continue this collaboration and partnership and allyship uh, that we've begun with our alumni, our networks, our university leaders, industry leaders. Uh, these webinar Wednesdays were started as a way for the Alumni Association to connect with FSU while we were in the virtual format. Um, and we're all working from home and they are evolving. And so for everyone joining us today, afterwards, you're gonna receive a survey and we want your feedback. Please share your ideas, but be sure you fill out that survey. We are listening. And um, I think by today's uh, attendance and the wonderful minds we have around on the panel today, we can really be effective in creating dialogue and looking at how we're gonna foster change. All right, thanks, Julie. Desi? All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dazi Lenore. I am a member of the National Alumni Board of Directors and was um, able to join the board, was elected to join the board back in 2017. Um, since being a member of the National Board of Directors, I have served on the Clubs and Networks Committee, as well as been um, fortunate enough to serve on the Board Development Committee for the past two years, which is the committee that does serve in the capacity of helping us to identify new and prospective board members that are going to be able to come on board and serve um, us on an association level. Um, I'm also the secretary this year and uh, midway through the spring had the opportunity to be selected to serve as chair of our governance committee and right now we are in a complete pretty much overhaul of um, our bylaws and making some changes to ensure that everyone has um, an appropriate voice and that they have the proper channels to be able to communicate and to, to share and weigh in on things um, that are happening on um, the board level. I will say that um, I am grateful for the opportunity to participate um, with the board development committee um, and have made it a point to be as active in selecting and going through those applications um, as possible as um, it gives us an opportunity to increase that diversity. And when I joined the board um, three years ago, there were four of us, um, not including the, the black alumni seat. Um, and I was the only black female at that time. During my participation on the board, we've had our first black chair, um, which we're very proud of. 
Um, and um, we have increased our numbers significantly, in my opinion, over the last two years. So now we have eight, not including um, the Black alumni seat, as well as the Student Alumni Association, who over the last three years, we've had two African-American presidents of the Student Alumni Association. So um, we are we are committed to diversity. We've worked very hard, not only to encourage people that we know who we feel would be qualified to apply for um, the positions so that they could be considered. And we work very hard to, to go through those applications and ensure that we are selecting individuals that would represent um, Florida State um, well and to ensure that we are increasing our diversity numbers. So we um, continue to work hard through that and we will have more that will be joining our board, you know, post our June board meeting when we, um, you know, confirm those new board members that have been selected that will be joining us officially in the fall. So um, we, we have taken strides and we continue to take significant strides to ensure that we do have a voice and that we are in the room when decisions are being made, um, when awards are being given out, um, and that we are able to affect positive change um, on the national alumni level. Thanks, Tazi. So I will talk a little bit about um, the FSU Black alumni. And there are, I understand that the tenor and the questions for today are not just about our organizations, but what are we doing? And what are we doing specifically around you know, racial injustice, police brutality? And so some of what I'll talk about right now is just the background of our organization and what we do in general. And then I'll get into more detail about our future plans when we get into the Q&A. But the FSU Black Alumni is a chartered um, affiliated constituent of the actual Alumni Association. So I wanted to clarify that for some people because they say, all right, there's the Alumni Association and then there's the Black Alumni. If you are part of the Black Alumni, you are part of FSU's Alumni Association. It's the same dues, it's the same membership. You are just designated as Black Alumni as your affiliation for purposes of the events that we put together and things like that. But make no, you know, to dispel any, any misunderstandings, the Black Alumni is part of the Alumni Association. It's not a separate organization. With that being said, as an organization, we were founded in 1983, and this was 21 years after the first uh, Black undergraduate student had uh, enrolled in FSU in 1962. His name was Maxwell Courtney and graduated um, three years later. So it took 20 years, but the Black alumni um, as a group was formed in 1983 because we recognized that there were specific things to black life at FSU and as an alumna or alumnus of FSU that were distinct and unique to the black experience. And we wanted to recognize those things and we wanted to support the students on campus. We wanted to support the black faculty and staff and we wanted to support black graduates of Florida State as well. And so the things that we do, a lot of, a lot of people ask, well, what exactly do you do? The black alumni if you are a member of the Black Alumni, it is a 100% volunteer organization. No one on our staff, no one on our executive board, the president, me as the vice president, no one gets paid to do this. And so outside of our normal jobs that we do to support our families, what we do is we advocate for students, faculty and staff, and alumni, Black alumni in specific. And we do this through a number of things. Um, one, we act as mentors to the BSU. When I was at Florida State, I was the BSU president my senior year at Florida State. And so uh, naturally, I have an affinity back to ensuring that the Black Student Union and the Black Student Union presidents are supported in whatever capacity um, they desire or that they, that they require. Some other things that we have done in terms of adv advocacy is when President Thrasher, who has been a great friend of the Black alumni, when he was... Um, running to become the president of Florida State, we requested and had a sit down with him and the rest of the candidates to ensure that in their candidacy and later whoever was going to be selected as president kept the black people of Florida State in mind. So students, faculty, alumni, that that was on the forefront or at least one of the bullets to be addressed in discussing what their plans for Florida State University were going to be. Um, the BSU house itself, again, 
I was the BSU president. We had a small house on Woodward Street. Several years ago, that house was put on the do not uh, maintain list, meaning that if anything was broken in that house, um, the university was not obligated to fix it. So when you see that $2 million BSU house that is currently sitting on campus, that is one of the jewels of the campus that the students use for classroom instruction, for social gatherings, for um, whatever purposes they, they use it for, lobbying for that house and fundraising for that house was done by the black alumni. Um, you know, I, there's a list of names from Sean Pittman to Eric Fryall to Connie E. Jenkins Pye and Cassandra Jenkins and myself. Even two years ago, I raised an additional $25,000 to donate to the BSU house as part of the funding of furniture and repayment for the $2 million that it took to build the house. So behind the scenes, a lot of the things that people take for granted when they say, you know, what are, what are you doing or how did this happen? It's the black alumni as an organization that is getting together and working independently and working uh, in partnership with a lot of the other organizations that you hear about and that you see about. Um, we are behind the scenes, we're in the forefront, but the things that um, people may not even consider as uh, advocacy, but someone had to do it. Someone had to be, you know, have a seat at the table. Someone had to be in those meetings. That's your black alumni at work. Those are the people who are volunteering their time and their efforts um, after hours on the weekends, late at night, you know, having these meetings with Julie, having these meetings with, uh, with Brandon. I know sometimes Brandon gets tired of me calling him on Saturday morning and say, hey, Brandon, I got something to talk with you about. That's what the Black alumni does. Um, we'll talk a little bit more later about engagement and some of the things that we need. Um, you know, I encourage people to speak up and be a voice. When you see something that doesn't sit well with you or you are requesting a change, you have a network in which your voice can be elevated and we represent you, but you have to get involved and engaged in order for that to happen. So I'll talk a little bit, of mo a little bit more about that uh, when we get into the Q&A. Um, Cause I could go on Julie for, you know, the rest of the call about some of the things that we do behind the scenes, but I know we need to get into the Q&A. So I actually uh, wanna go ahead and, and start that now if everybody's okay. Um, so thank you panelists for your backgrounds and a little bit about you know, who you are and the organizations that you represent. So thanks for sharing. We're gonna move into the questions and answer. And for our participants, we have over 250 participants on the webinar right now. When you registered, uh, you had the ability to submit a question or questions for our panel to, uh, to answer. And so obviously with this number of people registered for this webinar, we're not able to address every single question. Um, we'd be here for three days. But we did select um, some questions that were representative and we bundled some questions so that we could answer multiple questions at a time. And so we have um, some questions that we feel are representative of the list of questions that we receive. And we've assigned those questions to specific people in the panel. For our panelists, um, I'm gonna read the question to you. Um, I'd ask for your answer and then if there are other panelists who want to weigh in on that question, don't feel obligated, but if you want to, um, you have that opportunity as well. When we get done with our list of questions, if we have time left over, there are additional questions that we can go through as well. But I'll start with Michelle. The question is, what does FSU have in place for faculty and staff to ensure that there's true diversity and inclusion? And what is the best way to deliver diversity and inclusion training for new hires during their onboarding experience? How can we ensure the message does not get lost? Okay, so when, when you talk about being able to be here for about three days to talk on one subject, I could definitely do that um, related to what we offer to faculty and staff. But I'll do some highlights of some of the things that we um, currently have, and we've had them um, for a while. I'll point to the President's Council on Diversity and Inclusion. Um, that group has been in ex existence since 2008, I believe. Um, I came on board in 2014, and it's comprised of faculty, staff, students who are working on initiatives and programming and policies related to diversity and inclusion, but a lot of what we do has impact on um, faculty and staff and creating opportunities, professional development, 
um, addressing issues of inclusivity. And I will say that um, a shout out to the Black Alumni Association, Eric Frile has been a member of that council for three years now. And he has been very engaged in how we develop support for faculty and staff. Um, also, in addition to the President's Council, um, we do a lot of training. Um, Julie mentioned a certificate series that we have available for faculty and staff. It's a four-part um, module that ends with a capstone project. Um, we team teach that. Um, I partner with Miguel Hernandez in um, Student Affairs and other faculty volunteer their time um, to work on that certificate. Currently, we have about 200 plus folks um, who have completed that, that four-part module, module. And we think that's really important. Um, diversity and inclusion training is not a one-stop, I did it and you check the box. It is continuous and that's how we approach it, that it's constant learning and adapting um, to what the needs are of our campus community. And we always say that first and foremost, for us faculty and staff, we, were it not for the students, we wouldn't be here. So a lot of the training is focused on how we support students um, in um, their matriculation, but with specific emphasis on our students of color and those who are underrepresented. So a lot of work goes into that. So a lot of the training um, targets that for our faculty and staff. You know, how do you engage with students um, and understanding what they bring to the table, especially first generation students? Um, how do you um, infuse diversity and inclusion into your curriculum? Um, those kinds of things as well. We do a lot of partnering with academic affairs um, on, on that type of training. So we definitely are working to make sure that our workforce, both faculty and staff, are prepared to serve our students, um, and especially as it relates to diversity and inclusion. We also um, have been working with academic departments on um, diversity planning, particularly as it relates to recruitment and retention of diverse faculty. A few years back, the um, President's Council did some focus groups with underrepresented students and some things that came out of that is has been driving our work, you know, and one thing they said is that it's so important to me that when I walk into a classroom, I see myself at the front of the classroom, you know, so we're really working with academic affairs on how we recruit and retain faculty of color. And again, that goes to training, um, training search committees, um, having folks tap into their unconscious biases and be aware of them. So our uh, approach to training for faculty and staff um, touches on a lot of levels. Um, we do think it is very important that when you onboard that you know that diversity and inclusion is something that we value here at FSU, but also it's an expectation that when you are engaging that you understand that everyone owns that. So we do have available for faculty and staff who onboard um, online diversity and training, but we find that doing it in person and engaging is the most effective way. So we work real hard to stay available for um, departments and units um, for their onboarding of um, new faculty and staff, but we also just do regular training as well. Um, we, have a lot, we certainly have an uptick now um, in the requests and it's exciting to have that because we're ready. You know, we have been doing this for a while. So we are able to be very responsive to the needs of our campus community now. Hey, Michelle, really, really quickly. In terms of accountability and metrics, um, really quickly, what, what do you do to ensure that you're successfully uh, measuring mm -hmm. what you're doing? Well, two areas, particularly in my charge um, as the EOC director, we are responsible for a lot of reporting um, to the federal government, to the state, and each year we do an affirmative action plan for the university, which looks at our demographics as it relates to our faculty and staff. You know, what do our numbers look like? Is there pay equity? Um, you know, are we representing the availability that's out there to hire folks? So that affirmative action plan helps us just purely metrics and numbers and data to see what we look like and how we can do better. You know, we're not seeking to meet any quotas or anything of that nature, but we want to make sure that our workforce is representative of who we serve. That's one way. Another way is strategic plan. And that implementation committee that I mentioned earlier, um, we are, um, we've set some goals um, with regard to recruitment, retention of faculty and staff, but students as well. You know, so we are um, monitoring those goals, but you know, it's not enough just to look at the numbers. We're actually implementing programs to make sure um, that we're doing things that will increase those numbers. Okay. Um, mostly with um, admissions 
and things of that nature. Go ahead, Ali. All right, thanks, Michelle. We need to go ahead and move on to Brandon. Brandon, your question is, what ways can FSU better advocate for black and brown students on campus? How can university leadership set examples of real change? Absolutely, and thank you for that question. As you can imagine, this is a, a question that has been weighing heavy on us as of late, and, and we've had a lot of conversation around this. So I think there are several things that we can do. Um, I, I'll mention just a few today. Uh, one of the biggest things I think we can do is actually pretty simple. Uh, I think we could spend some more time simply asking our black and brown students what they need to feel and to be supported. Um, you know, our students are not shy. So if, if we ask them, I think they will tell us. Um, I think there are students telling us now, but I think we need to spend some more time asking a, a greater variety of our students. Right now, we're hearing a lot from our student leaders. Um, I think we need to dig a little deeper to speak to more of our student population and just to ask them directly. Um, I think some of that advocacy goes back to what uh, Michelle just mentioned. I think that we, we have to get more black and brown faculty and staff on board. Students need to feel represented. They need to see people um, and not just our support staff, you know, not our custodians, not just our custodians and, and maintenance workers, but they need to see uh, black and brown faculty and staff in, in leadership positions and in impactful positions. Um, so I think that's one of the ways that, that we could work to advocate. Um, and when I think about ways that the university leadership can set examples of real change, one of the biggest things that I think about is we need to make our actions match our words. And so when we say we value diversity and inclusion, our actions need to match that. And, and so I think we have an obligation as uh, faculty and staff to work towards that. We have an obligation um, and, and a duty to ensure that our uh, searches are, are very diverse and that we're working very hard to diversify uh, new staff when we're bringing them in. And I think one of the other pieces that we can work on and we know that we are in the capital. We know that Florida State is an economic engine and powerhouse here, in, in the, in the, not only in Tallahassee, but also in the state. I think we also need to leverage our roles and our position um, as Florida State, as, as faculty and staff at Florida State, um, to be the voice for our students at the local, state, um, and even national level when the students aren't able to, to voice those concerns outside of our, our local and regional areas or we need to be able to find ways to put them in positions where we can support them and, and getting that voice out there. And so um, I think this is a question we will continue to, to discuss for um, quite, a, quite a bit from, from now on. I think that this will be an ongoing conversation, especially as we think about positive, sustainable change. This can't be a one and done conversation. And I think we owe it to our students. And if we're gonna advocate for them, uh, we can't have one listening session and be done. I think we have, we have to have a listening section, a session and then uh, some action items and then talk about longevity. How are we gonna sustain this? All right, thanks Brandon. The next question is actually directed to me. Uh, the question is, how can we build a relationship between black alumni and black students to support them during their experience at FSU? And what partnership will the FSU Black Alumni Network and the university have on making change on campus and in the community? Um, so when I was talking a little bit about what the Black alumni as an organization does, um, it's what we should be doing in relation to our Black students is an extension of what we're already doing. But in my opinion, we need to formalize some of those relationships where we act as a mentoring organization to the BSU. My vision and the vision of Shari Williams, who is our president, is that there's a formal mentoring relationship between black alumni individuals and black students on campus. So it's not just me or Shari speaking to the BSU president. It's not just an organization speaking to another organization, but that we match black students with black graduates. There's not a job that you're looking for as a student that we don't already have a black graduate in that position who can help you mentor you um, you can be an apprentice to what they're already doing in industry. And that goes beyond just profession. That goes into advocacy. That goes into philanthropy. The things that our students are looking to do and want to do, we have Black professionals and we have Black graduates doing those things. And so when we put this program in place, you know, I'm looking right now, we have 250 participants on this webinar. 
we need more than the same 10, 12, 15, 20 people to volunteer to be mentors back to our black students. We need the 250 people on this webinar and the 2000 black graduates who are part of the black alumni to all volunteer to be mentors back to our students on campus. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is in relationship to the community at large, uh, a program that we are initiating um, because I want to, I want to talk future, not just what we've done. And, you know, this isn't the justification for what we've done in the past. We need to talk about how we can positively change the future. So a program that we are initiating and that I've already had some discussions um, two weeks ago, I actually had a call with the executive director of Noble, which is the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. The Black alumni as a network has regional uh, groups all throughout the state of Florida, right? We have organizations in Jacksonville, Tallahassee, Pensacola, Miami, Orlando, Tampa, you know, all sp spread out. But we also have groups in Atlanta and in New York and in Washington, D.C. and in New Orleans and in L.A. What I would like to put together, and, and I've already spoken with Shari and we have full support of our organization, is that each of our regional uh, groups works with the local noble chapter to put together a workshop series specifically related to one police brutality and two engaging with law enforcement as a black person in the united states if we are going to make substantive changes in our community we have got to get out there and we have to be on the front line of making tangible steps so i often hear people say we need to have a conversation on dot, dot, dot. And my question is, if not now, when are we going to have that conversation? And so it's not enough to say we need to have a conversation. We need to actually organize those meetings. And so it was a natural sort of extension of that thought that said we have regional representation and we have coverage across the United States. We also have this organization, Noble, that is represented in all 50 states. Why don't we partner with Noble to create or it's not even creating that because we're not recreating the wheel we are leveraging what's already in place but putting some more meat to it and using our alumni network sort of as a driving force behind that so as a, as a group as a black alumni organization those are two programs that i can point to that specifically impact students on campus but then also impact the the community at large okay um, the next question is for Bridget. Bridget, how can FSU support educators who want to teach civil rights history honestly? And what do you suggest white parents do or teach their children to help minimize implicit attitudes of racism? Well, I mean, that, those are two big topics. We could talk about it for weeks. But I think that um, my number one uh, piece of advice or, or, you know, I guess approach would be uh, to, to have conversations about race. There are a lot of, of, of um, resources out there that can help you to do that. Uh, some of the ones that I like for educators, the College of Education put out a very good anti-racism list this uh, past week. Uh, Tolerance.org has complete lesson plans. Um, the Equal Justice Initiative has a really good site, PBS, the Library of Congress, New York Times. But I think that, that uh, one of the things that we have to get comfortable with is having these conversations. You don't start out in first grade in calculus. You have to start out learning addition and subtraction. You keep doing it over and over again. You incorporate it into your life and then it's not awkward. The conversations about race and racism are awkward because we don't have them. And so really scaling that to the education level of kids. But, you know, Tamir Rice was a kid. So you can have a conversation about what happened to another kid with kids. And it is difficult uh, to get started, but there are a lot of resources out there that can help you to do that. I also think that um, you can make it local. So talking about the Tallahassee bus boycotts or talking about the Grove Plantation, or even FSU itself, which we know was built with, you know, black labor. 
um, to have those honest conversations about how we got to where we are and how we get further is something that you can do with kids. It's not a thing that's beyond them to talk about the history of this country. And there are lots of resources out there. Um, incorporating viewpoints from other cultures. So just making that a part of your practice that when you're in classes, especially classes that are homogenous. So if all the kids in the class are black, that doesn't mean we don't have to address race. And if all the kids in the class are white, that doesn't mean we don't have to address race. We should be having these conversations with kids from an early age so that when we get to college, when we get to places where we are the policymaker and the, you know, the person who gets to make the decisions about what equity and inclusion look like, we have the, school, the tools and the skills and the ability to do that. And I have very similar advice for parents. Um, I would make it local. So visit things in your area. Go to the south side if, you're, if you live on the northeast side and see what's different about that. See, you know, talk to, to your kids about what implicit bias looks like. There's a lot of really cool um, tests online where you can take tests that show you what your implicit biases are and you can talk about that. Um, uh, Tallahassee in particular, although there are many communities out there in the country that are like this, are really segregated. So the neighborhoods are predominantly white or predominantly black. So inviting someone who doesn't look like you into your home or having interactions with people like modeling for your kids that, that you actually do, not like I have a black friend, but that you actually have black friends, you interact with black people or people of other races, colors, backgrounds, um, is the thing that you should do. And then I guess my, I don't want to talk too long, but my last piece of advice uh, for parents is to incorporate one hard thing into your vacations. So it's really common to go to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. It's really common to go to the Holocaust Museum if you're in you know, Germany. Go to a plantation. Go to a former slave market site. Go to the civil rights and social justice museums in the area that you're vacationing in and have a conversation about what that looks like. I, I'm gonna repeat myself, how we got here and why this is important for you to know as a, as a parent and as a kid, you know? So I think that that's a thing that we can all do and you can figure out where you wanna put it in so that most of your vacation is a joyous experience, but that you have real conversations about how you get to have this joyous experience. Um, so that is, I guess, uh, my final piece on All right. that. Thanks, Bridget. Julie, um, what actions will the Alumni Association take to support Black alumni as we reach for equality? What has helped you be more effective and a more effective advocate? And what advice do you have for others who want to advocate? Uh, thank you. I think some of Bridget's suggestions will make me a more effective advocate, and I will be thinking of that when I plan my next vacation, for sure. Um, you know, one of the things I've committed to is ensuring continued support for our Black Alumni Association and for our networks. And that looks for us like um, budget support, how, um, you know, we are a membership-based organization. Uh, our membership is growing and that's good. When it's growing, we're able to provide more support. And that means something when, when you're able to put some uh, monetary support behind what you're um, you are espousing to engage. Um, I think educative opportunities are very important for how we move forward. Uh, days like today, conversations like we're having right now, how we move forward over the summer and the fall, continuing to have dialogue like this. Perhaps it's on, um, you know, in this important year, voting rights, nonpartisan. How are we, um, you know, educating folks and continuing um, that dialogue with our alumni as after they leave campus, after they're done being students, there's still educative opportunities that we can help leverage. Um, you know, I think it's important too, not only looking at the diversity of staff and, and those on our board, how are we using their voices when we create those spaces and they're on our board? And I think that's um, important that we're not, I think somebody mentioned it earlier, checking boxes that we are ensuring when we're taking these steps and when the right people are in the room, how their voices are heard when they're in the room. Um, 
I think what's helped me be a more effective advocate is the relationships of many of you. Um, you know, I know that we have um, some young alumni leaders on the call, Derek, we have Dane in LA, I think is on the call. We have, of course, uh, Eric and Connie and Cassandra and all of you today, um, members of this panel, the board, listening to those lived experiences is helpful and it matters. And I think that's what's um, meaningful, particularly right now. Um, I think I can understand, but listening to those who have lived experiences helps shape uh, not only how I lead this organization, but how I understand FSU and how we can move forward. Um, and I think for advising others, you know, of how to be an advocate to do the same is listening. And we, you've heard that a lot this week. We want to be advocates and allies by listening. We also have to listen and act and listen for those lived experiences that we won't know. It, our allies won't know these experiences. But I know that when we have true dialogue and are willing to share them, it's impactful. Um, and for those who want to advocate, investing in those first generation students who are coming to FSU, investing in what you were saying, Ali, in the mentorship and working to formalize some of those um, connections, inviting students to shadow you so they see an alumni success story, they see themselves in your success, um, and using your own platforms to address these issues of inequality and injustice, I think is how I would um, talk to others about being an advocate. Great, great, thanks, Julie. And Dazi, uh, following up on that, what more can we do as a board to support black alumni? Um, what would you advise a white alumnus and parent of a current FSU student to do to help? Okay, um, well, like everybody else said, we could be here for a very long time addressing both of these questions, but, to your point, Ali, I think that we can sometimes, or at least I can sometimes take for granted the fact that we are attending these meetings and that we are available and we're hearing what's going on and we're, we're well aware of what's happening at Florida State University on a higher level. And I think that as a board member, that we could certainly do a better job of communicating that out to the, um, the Black alumni population and letting them know exactly what's happening exactly what successes that we have had. Um, I've read a, a whole lot of comments on last week about um, different things. And I think that we absolutely could do a better job of communicating not only what we're doing, but communicating ways in which alumni who seek to be more engaged have an opportunity to do that. Case in point, when we go through our application process and our, our national board application does come out in the fall, one of the questions on that application is, what have you done since you graduated um, to give back to Florida State or to help enrich the Florida State family community? It's word, it's, you know, some way like that. But, you know, when we have to make calls to applicants that we weren't able to advance, part of that oftentimes is because there wasn't enough engagement with the university. And, um, you know, that engagement can come in a whole host of different ways. It can it come from you being involved in your specific college, if that's your passion. It could come with you being involved on a local level, a club level. Um, I was involved in the, the Seminole Club of Orlando um, before being involved um, in Tallahassee. And, um, you know, there are just a whole host of ways in which we can help alumni to be more connected, you know, to your point, whether that's mentoring or what have you, but in order for us to continue to be able to be involved, to continue to have a voice, then we need to be equipped with what we need to have so that when those applications come around, that we are able to put forth the strongest applications possible. So, you know, um, I would encourage all of us to continue to be, to be involved and to seek to be involved and also for us to be able to communicate to our black alumni those resources available so that they can get involved. Um, if they need a connection with their college that we're able to make that connection or if um, they need to be put in contact with the local club that they have an opportunity to do that because unless we, we get folks prepared, you know, that stifles our pipeline as to who our future board members are going to look like. And we wanna ensure that we are um, increasing that communication and that we are giving our alum what they need in order to be um, 
as well prepared as possible so that they can take the next steps to be involved with Florida State on a, a higher level. Um, as it relates to what I would tell a parent, I can say, and I imagine a number of you have received calls or texts or, you know, Facebook messages or whatever from your friends, your white friends, you know, in some capacities apologizing for what's going on in our country um, and some asking what they can do. And, you know, one of my good friends from way back from middle school, and we're still very good friends now, you know, wants or has made a pledge to start those conversations to um, Ms. Birmingham's point. Um, I've had conversations over the last week, many conversations with colleagues about, you know, discrimination and discrimination I experienced as a student, discrimination I, was, I have experienced as a professional, um, and even discrimination that our children have experienced it because it can start just that early. And the responses that I have gotten were pretty much astonishment, like, oh, wow, this stuff still happens. And it, it absolutely happens. And my response to them was that we we have learned how to adapt to certain situations, whether it's the classroom or whether it's, you know, in professional environments or what have you. But starting those conversations with your friends and seeking to understand, I think, is a, a good springboard for conversations with your family who don't agree or conversations with your colleagues or, you know, not that you should create any you know, discord in your workplace, but just starting to have these discussions so that you can understand the perspective. Because I think that once you do have a greater understanding, it's harder for you to continue to, to operate in that same manner. So um, I echo everything that Ms. Birmingham said with regard to just having these discussions and initiating these discussions, because it's, I think it's vital um, to how we operate as adults and, and to that point how our children are able to be reared um, because without proper instruction they grow up carrying the same thought processes that their parents have and the cycle just continues to repeat itself so all right thanks Dazi um, we only have a minute left so to Dazi Michelle Bridget Julie and Brandon thank you for participating thank you for your candid open and honest um, answers. We know that an hour is not enough, right? This is, each one of these topics need to be discussed at length in order to, again, recognize where we're coming from, but make plans of how we make real changes going forward. And so with that, we'll conclude this part of the panel. I'll turn it back over to Julie for our closing remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ali, for handling. And as I said, you have to drive today. So you, uh, uh, certainly led us so well through this important discussion. Thank you, Bridget, Brandon, Michelle, Dazi, for volunteering your time to continue this conversation. I look forward on building on this as we move forward. Um, the university certainly is better because of alumni like you who are dedicating such time and care and effort in, into this conversation. Our webinar is just one of the first of many steps that we will look to be taking to support our black alumni and to further this conversation um, as we engage our alumni and then certainly internally in the Alumni Association as, as the present CEO, we're committed to, to fostering an environment of change. So I want you to follow us on social media. Uh, we are listening, we value your feedback and look for our emails and monthly newsletters for upcoming opportunities. And many of you today are members on the call, and I wanna thank you so much for your commitment to our organization. Members make all of this possible, um, and we look forward to furthering this with you as we move into the future. Ali, best to you and thank to you. all of our panelists, and as always, go Knowles. Go Knowles. <laughs>